Um, but to start, well, firstly, thank you for inviting me. It's you know, in these post-COVID, is that the right way this world? It's really nice to give talks to real people, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, and I, I caught myself out when Joe um, invited me to do this, because we had a chat about the discussion, so I came up with that. And then I kept started putting this together last week and thought, oh, hang on, there's so much. And so I was just saying to the gentleman who's sitting next to me in the audience, um, at one point, two days ago, I had 105 slides. And it was a real thing of, oh, no, I've got to cut them down. I've only got three quarters of an hour, 44 minutes now. Um, so I have cut them down. What I, if, you, if I have told you too much at the end of this, maybe that's the point. There is so much in this area. Um, so I have given you a sort of selection. I've also put in a couple of little breaks. So if at one of those breaks you think we've had enough, we're going home. Just let me know, and I won't go any further. <laughs> right, so first slide, please. You will see me use this before because it tells the point really well. It's a, a, a plan of the area, as you may have seen. It's all just up there, way there, put together oh, about 10 years ago now, but it really makes its point. I think the colours haven't quite come out perfectly, but it doesn't matter because what I like to use this for is to show that apart from the, the square, which is outdated anyway, every blob on there is a scheduled monument. That is, archaeological remains of national importance that are legally protected. Um, lots of people have come up with many other things that they felt were nationally important as well, but those are the ones with the legal protection on them. It's your Christmas quiz if ever you have these things, spot the monument. One point for Major Candle. Ten points for Valley of Stone. Um, and the other thing is, I will talk a bit about round barrows, one stage barrows, and you don't need contours on this map because round barrows are usually on hilltop. So if you want to know where the top of the ridgeway is between Dorchester and Weymouth, <coughs> all of the barrows, and they sort of divide off around either side of the Bride Valley. Um, I could almost leave that as that's my point, we've got loads, haven't we? Um, but let's go into a bit more detail. I'll try and go through Dorchester first, and then um, expand it a bit. So, in the sort of order, firstly, it's about how much people take in. I like encouraging people to have a look around when they're going to places. And I suspect a lot of people, well, I know it from taking them on walks, have never seen these. That's just outside Waco in Dorchester. So if you're coming out the door of Waitrose and you're going round to the lift, you go past there and there's the potter in that way. Those are interpretation panels and very good for their age, put up in the mid-1980s when the Tudor Arcade uh, development happened um, what, on what had been known as Greyhound Yard, the pub that was there. The big archaeological excavation and those show a sequence of the Neolithic from about 2500 BC just after the Neolithic, when this thing went down, and then Roman medieval and more recent. And for its time, that's been pretty darn good. What's this? Um, this is extraordinary, in my opinion. Can I have the next slide? Here? This is a plan of the area. Uh, so, I, especially in East Street, South Street, that's away, Acton Road, there's Waitrose. Beneath Waycrows, well, the archaeologists digging Greyhound Yard knew they were in a medieval town, Roman town, so they dug away, got to the bottom, probably thought they'd nearly finished, and found some enormous holes. Um, tree holes. They're not post holes, they were where trees were. And you see that there, if it's clear, that's Waycrows, and there's a black thing there. That is that line of posts. Uh, and you're not supposed to take people to see them then, there now, um, but they are visible in the basement of the car park in Waitrose. For safety reasons, Waitrose, for very good safety reasons, people don't want tour parties wandering around when there's cars over the place. But if you're in the basement, you will see a series of red circles. And again, good interpretation for its time, showing where those posts were. No, posts, I'm going to tell them, they're tree holes, they're massive. Um, the excavators 
work the bias where they can extrapolate to this curve and came to a conclusion that there was a whole well a circle that went all the way to Salisbury Field. Then in the 1980s, on how can I put this, the first attempt to develop Charles Street, say no more, um, archaeological trial trenches were dug and they found the same posts, post arrangement, with that trench there and that trench there, on a slightly different arrangement. So actually, it's curving around a bit. It's still stupidly big, but it's not quite as big. Um, and why did people do that two and a half thousand years ago? My interpretation is they started doing it and they almost couldn't stop. They were showing off. It was um, the equivalent of a team building exercise. You're a bunch of farmers all desperately trying to make a living. When you get a bit of time, you do something together, which maybe brings a bit of social cohesion. You know, the equivalent of a club like this or something like that. People get together, see each other, work together, and think, they're not that bad, really, are they? Because look, they're working away as hard as I do. And for a time, between about 3000 and 2000 BC, just four and a half thousand years ago, that seems to be all they did in their spare time in Dorchester, because there's loads of others, and you keep finding more. Uh, so the next one, please. Just in case you don't know, more we rings. I have to mention this because it's quite special, but so it's now, next time you go to Morby Rings, have a look round because it's hidden in the town almost. But there was actually something called Allington Bridge, the high ground that you see, for instance, the trees on it, if you're on Maiden Castle and looking in its direction. It goes all the way along that the way. And Morby Rings is on that bridge. So next one, Bridge. So I took earlier in 1910. <laughs> I love showing this because it shows the old arrangement of the railway station, how it was originally, but we haven't got time for that tonight. Um, and it's the moment amphitheatre, isn't it? It's a cottage. But in the 1970s, an archaeologist called Richard Bradley looked again at the excavations that happened on the site in 1910 and realised what the excavations had missed was that underneath those earth banks was another prehistoric monument. Not quite as big as the Roman Amphitheatre, but, you know, pretty darn sizable, with, um, he thought, maybe up to 45 holes, 10 metres deep, dug in a circle inside, with stuff in there, Animal bones, food we made like that, pottery and so forth, maybe gifts to the gods. Um, why? I don't know. Because we don't have written records, this is prehistory. But you can guess, offerings to the gods, something like that. Let's find some more. Let's see. Who on this picture? Need a bit of explanation. That's Max Gate. No, silly. There's my case. There's the five pass. And that's the road out to Wareham. And if you go up to Wareham, you can see uh, the Wareham Road, that's the road that goes off towards West Stafford and Crossway. But also, that's part of that same bridge, Allington Bridge. And archaeologists have found barrows, which more later on this area and so forth. But there's two more monuments here. Uh, flagstones. And Mount Pleasant. What's the third one? There's something that may be another barrel there, Conquer Barrel. And quite a lot of archaeological work has happened on these. They are, let me give you the dates, let me refer to my notes. Um, Flagstones is actually a bit earlier than the most, most of the rest of them. It's a bit before 3000 BC, so a little over 5000 years old. Uh, and Mount Pleasant is theoretically. Dates were from about 2,900 to 2,500 BC, but with something else from uh, 2,000 BC added later. Does it sound complicated? Yes, of course it is. So let's have a look at one of them. I can't remember which one it was. It's that one. That's it. That's Mount Pleasant, but it's not quite. In 1970, uh, an archaeologist from but Richard, I think it was, certainly Wainwright, Jeffrey Wainwright, that's him, carried out an excavation, finding a large ditch, like circular ditch, um, with more stupidly big post-setting circles. 
presumably linked up with other cross pieces, like you've got like the Triathlon of Stonehenge or something like that. And everyone looks at this and thinks he's excavating the whole site. And I'm just trying to pick out, I can tell you, you can see people, I think they're just there. So that gives you an idea of scale. They're about people's size if they're not. Um, but could we just go back? Because you think he excavated that, didn't he? No, he didn't. He excavated that little green thing there. That's the bit that was added in about 2000 BC, added later on. He did some other trenches elsewhere. But that thing that looks quite massive, that thing is the back of the that thing. Is, oh, <laughs> is it when I go near? It it's, it's not a touch screen. That's the circle. There's a little circle in there. Next one, next one. That's that other little circle. Just to show you, I'm not making it up. Again, massive, stupidly massive. That's all. And this is quite so. Now, when Thomas Hardy was uh, constructing Max Gate, he found, um, I think, some prehistoric burials and one of the sarsen stones and so forth. If anyone knows where I live, there's a sarsen stone outside my house. And I've got very clearly that my house was built about the same time and it's one of the ones that was dumped um, by the builders there. They wanted to get rid of it. And someone else said, well, I'll put it outside where Steve Wallace is going to be <laughs> to protect it from traffic. So I'm very happy about it. Hardy was a great advocate of archaeology and it should all be recorded. Except for my house, it's too much. However, when the um, bypass was being built next door in the 1980s, um, Washington Archaeology did a major excavation and found this other enclosure here, which they, is particularly early, so before 3000 BC. But can you see, there's all sorts of things going on. They find stones in there, so sarsen stones. That might have come from west of Dorchester, but I wonder if there was some something like fold from wood that um, were knocking around then and have since all gone, something like that. Um, but also they dug a series of ditches. They didn't dig a ditch all around, they dug almost like a series of pits in the line. And hopefully the next slide will make that point for you. It's like cheated. This is not Dorchester area, unless you've been very generous. This is on a uh, a pipeline excavation um, a few years ago, west of Bear Regions. But I want to show this because this is something that might be a barrow, burial mound, or some other prehistoric monument, but it's dug in the same way. Because the archaeologists have dug out the fill of all those individual features. And instead of having what we would normally think of as a ditch surrounding something all the way around, it's more like a series of pits of varying sizes in a circle. And I I am not a great prehistoric expert, but I look at that, and you know, you could look at that and come up with your own views, but my view in that is what mattered was the digging. It was that a group of people got together and marked out that area. And I think that was either one person or one family. So it's almost like you folks decided to make the Dorset Civic Society Memorial, pop down the public arms with your shovels and thought, we're going to do that, we will all stand in a rough circle and dig until sunset, or the pub's open, one or the other, and then when you've finished, that'll do, because you've done it together and you've marked out that area. And that's, that's what you see, like some of the earlier monuments, they're not that desperately keen to make it like we would think, same depth and even all around, it's almost like it's the digging that matters. And then it's over. Another one of my favourite maps, because it shows so much, um, of Dorchester, the, the Roman bands that I want to mention later on. I found out what might be some new information for you on them. Um, list of buildings are shown there as triangles. If any people think that Dorchester didn't, well, Dorchester, start that again. Dorchester until the 1850s was much smaller than the Roman town. The red line marks the extent of the Roman town, or as it was after 100 years or so. And those triangles are listed buildings, so they tell you where roughly where the older parts of the town were two or 100 years ago. So, And they're a bit more the prison, they're basically on a T-shape. 
there'll be big open areas that were undeveloped, which is why the Roman baths survived quite well, uh, and why the Roman townhouse survived really well on the grounds of County Hall, because that was um, the parkland of Colleton, of Colleton House. Um, so Dorset was quite a small place until quite recently. Um, Again, yeah, something that a lot of people probably see, the fountain in Princess Street, now the, the entrance to the old um, County Hospital site, obviously now moved. Looks quite nice, very pleasant. And I often you know, tell people what it is, and they don't know. But this is the spot where the archaeologist Bill Putnam, who did an awful lot of work on Dorchester's Roman aqueduct, um, roughly reckoned that the aqueduct stopped. So that aqueduct. First of all, it's extraordinary in that we're now into the Roman period. The Roman army gets to Britain, got the hang of it, attacking other people's countries, and knows that it's not simply about killing people, it's about control, making them want to be Romans so that they pay taxes, and the Roman army can go off and conquer some other folks, so So, they want people to be Roman, so they're trying to show off to people, you want to be like us, and you certainly don't want to be against us because we're so well organized militarily. But I think the aqueduct was part of that. They are showing off water. Look, we've got running water. But the magic to local people, I think, is that they made water run on a chalk hill. Um, next one, please. How did they do that? Very careful engineering work. Um, why is it magic? Well, chalk is permeable. If you dig a hole in chalk, I think that would be my pond, you can forget it because the water is going to go through the chalk, you've got to mine it. So what the Roman army does is construct, well, this is sort of the replacement, but it gives you a very good idea, a terrace with a slope of 1 in 1750 all the way from, it keeps varying, either a dam just opposite Frampton, so a good five miles away, or maybe further up the Froome Valley, depending on the latest thinking. But nevertheless, it survives really well in places like here at Simpson Foundry Camp. And what they're doing is they are getting the right line from two goes, they'll put them fixed, and then digging the channel, lining it with clay, and letting running water go through it. The problem with it is that if you want to avoid, um, how can we put this, uh, Local, the local population expressing their views in a full and forthright way. <laughs> Centurion, what's that floating in my backwater? Um, you've got to cover it over. And it also stops the sheep doing the same sort of thing. That then makes it very difficult to see leaks. So it's, it's a really good show thing, but it probably doesn't work very well in the long term. So it may be only used for 100 years. And then it will be. But, Bill Putnam thought it started up here opposite Crampton. And what I've got on this, some of the red bits are how it fits the survive and still needs to protect it. But it goes in and out of all these little side coons there. And my photo was taken from Poundry Camp there, so we had to go all the way around like that to get there. And it's an extraordinary piece of work. Um, and it's also probably a good thing for the Roman army if you've got soldiers to keep quiet and busy, given that to do as well as setting out the town and building the road network and fighting. So there's the walks. Again, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but I just like saying it again. To me, the walks are clear proof that Dorchester 300 years ago was not full of people who could just about grow their own turnips, which is the impression you get sometimes when you um, read some novels and so forth. These were people who were really well up with the latest ideas. Um, the Roman town had three sets of banks and ditches around it from about the year 200. So after it had been in existence for over a century, it decides to build these things, and they are massive. And by the time about 1700, the town realizes that it doesn't need these defenses anymore because artillery got much better. They're not sure what to do, so they have this great idea of flattening them out mostly and constructing these boulevards in the latest continental fashion. So our predecessors in Dorchester 300 years ago were not you know, chewing bits of straw uh, and so forth. They were in great contact with the rest of Europe. 
and the food courtesy of the city of Peter Bellamy. This is the upper uh, excavation that took place a few years ago when the tennis court and the bottom of the gardens had been laid out on the old building alley. We conveniently located archaeologists. The photographer is standing on the walks, which is on the inner bank of those defences. And it's a bit mocked up by other um, service trenches and so forth, but Claire Randall there is standing at the beginning of the first ditch, that ditch end there, and then Kirsty and Peter, clear over there, are standing in the second ditch, the bank between is gone. The third ditch is in that other trench. And if any of you remember about the garden's house a few years ago, that collapsed a bit, some of the walls needed to be repaired, and I couldn't even saw that. Lots of archaeologists locally were saying, we know what that is. They thought they built it on solid chalk, but it may be that they'd actually built it on the fill, the infill of the outer ditch, which was a bit weak at the end of the building collapsing with. A bit more near the time for you, in terms of work. This is, um, this is what the Roman army was doing. It was doing the aqueduct and so forth, but it was also laying out the town. So the Roman army probably gets to this area and built a fort, I think, or well, not just me, not suppose, that is in the northwest corner of the town. So we may be just about within the area of the Roman fort. So let's try and explain that later if you're interested. But what he's doing is laying out the town. It's not that you're building all the houses, but he's laying the plots out and he's putting in the infrastructure. And this section of wall, uh, road found when the um, county museum was being extended or beforehand, and you may have seen it because there were open areas for people to come and visit the excavation. Um, it's just one of the many roads in Dorchester, it's not even a main one, and yet it's got about half a metre of tightly packed flint all the way along it on that short bank. That seems to be like the soldiers following the manual. This is what it says we've got to do, this is what we're going to do, lads, off we go. That sort of thing. So, what's the Roman army doing? It's, it's building a town so that people like its own veterans, like the chap called Bassus, whose tombstone is on display in the museum and was found later, could live here, and local people and traders and what could live here as well and found the town. I've got to say this because it pays my wages. The Roman townhouse, um, this, hopefully, a lot of you have seen it, but this is something we have um, done up. Uh, quite recently, we got a town council, a, a council, we got heritage lottery funding and lots of other partners, town council, museum, and others working on this. Uh, this is the 1930s excavation. The Roman townhouse. I love this. Another good picture that tells the story. In the very far corner is Colleton House. This was Colleton Park. This is the 1930s excavation. I I think this might mean something like August Bank Holiday 1937, I won't bore you why I think that, um, of the start of the excavation of the Roman townhouse. Those people are standing on the original ground surface. The archaeologists, to get to that bit of wall, had to take off about, excuse me, that much soil, if that. It is not deeply buried, but so now when you go to the townhouse and you see all the problems we're having, because it's in a dirty great hall with car muffler and the water running off. Actually, then it was under a very shallow soil, and it's only because Dorchester had not expanded to fill the whole growing defences. You've got a really well preserved building like that without more, you know, more recent cellars cutting through it and all sorts of other things. So that's the Roman townhouse of what did I say, about four years ago when we had the latest go at doing it up again. Um, all sorts of problems, it's in the hole. Those trees look good, but they're causing uh, shading and so forth, and uh, antisocial behaviour. The building, the cover building covered over there in the 90s is showing its age. Accessibility is a real problem. People find it get, difficult to get to, etc., etc. So we had another go. Oh, yeah, antisocial behaviour. That made just like a plastic bottle, I think, the bomb. Um, or because people were taking drugs and so forth, and that's the roof of the cover building with all sorts of moss growing on it. That's just two of the issues. Before you sent the two of them. So off we go, get the money, good old Hedges Lottery Fund. So if you bought a lottery ticket in about 19, 2018, 2019, thank you. That's when you can your money went to.
We're using our personal track company, Context One Hundred Local Services, to dig out the new entrance ramp. We knock the walls around County Hall are listed. They're about three hundred years old. Just there, the walls are quite apart. But we found a um, gateway that had been blocked up in the nineteen fifties when County Hall was being built, so it was not approved. And then we put in the entrance ramp that cuts through the Bowman Rampart, hence the Oxford Reservation there. New paths, access routes, and so forth. Um, that surface may have to change, but we have to go with it there, next concrete. Uh, those trees were cut down, but lots of good planting instead. Uh, that is going in in March 2021, next concrete. New seating area, of course, a lot of controversy at the time, particularly when Claire was making his left the site for a month or two to leave, let some concrete dry out, and people said, What are you doing? You begin? And we had to say, hang on a minute, she hasn't let it dry out yet. We come back and paint it with the pencil. Um, so you might argue, and I myself, to be honest, um, that that amphitheater style seating is not what you normally expect on a domestic site. It does mean a lot of people who use the site, want to come there uh, and care about it, which is what I think we need for monuments on display. Uh, conservatives doing a really good cleanup uh, of the mosaics and so forth inside, but we're always going to have problems with that because it's in a big hole and it's always going to flow to some degree. Uh, and that's what it looks like in a slightly different colour uh, when we just about finished. In fact, I think that, that was this summer with lots of planting, but also, yeah, the planting and so forth, new seating area over there, just to make it a nice place. And then we'll be just to prove the point, wildflowers and the bees. You know, that's what we wanted job done in that thing. It's a nice place to go to. Right. When Gareth Jones became mayor last about May of last year, he said to me, People keep saying they want to get the Roman Bath exposed again. Can you find out any more? So I went off to Islamic England, had a chat with one of their science advisors and the local inspector and didn't find out much. One thing I learned then was that, I don't know if you know this, but when the baths were found, and this complex of buildings was found in 1977-78, there was one open day in 1978, as far as I understand it, where lots of local people went to see it, and there are still people who are annoyed that it was covered over and it's not on display. So, what decided at the time, because there weren't resources to put it on, on display, was to protect it. The archaeologists who did the digging deliberately didn't go into these structures so far. They just, did, in many cases, just went down enough to understand what was there. So they haven't really, didn't really get a full uh, understanding of the whole, the whole business. But they got a fair idea, because always they were aware that it was going to be preserved. But the way they preserved it was something that in the 1970s was really top notch again. They used something called Terra, geotechnical membrane. When you see it, it looks like sort of plastic sheet. It doesn't look very special, but it supposedly protects it. So put that all over it, well done. Cover that in sand, well done again. And then soil and so forth and build the car park. Now Wollaston Fields car park. You folks asked me to do this talk, and I thought, I'll use that as an excuse. I was bound to ask me about the Roman facts. So I went back, chased again. Thank the Sasha Chapman, the local sort of inspector who put me in contact with the right people. I got some use, more useful information. So I'm going to try and share this with you, being aware that there's limited time. So first of all, I mentioned to them that we heard that Taran Oh yeah, that's, sorry. that's what I found out in, late, in 2021. The Terran they put down at the time they thought would protect the archaeology, but more recent work has shown that it tends to stick to things like mosaics and so forth, which, you know, isn't good. So I've asked a person who's called Nicola Hembury, who's uh, an archaeological excavation principal at Historic England, about Terran. And she says to me in response, as you say, there are concerns not just that Terran can stick to remains, especially mosaics, but also that it can wick moisture and encourage mold growth. I say wick means that it draws it up. 
So in the case of our recent bill of excavation, with areas of that we have rewritten our backfilling methodology to do to, to, to basically only use them at the end. They, and it's even where, where we're about using sand. So this is buried still. They did their very best, but it's got um, tamam over it, which is not good. So if anyone is ever in the future thinking of ex re-exposing that, they would need to, I think, find out first of all what damage the tamam has done, the stuff that's sort of protected. Did the terror have a lot of That's a good question. I, they didn't say anything defective other than I've not heard anything otherwise. So I, I'm the way they talk about it, I'm assuming they're thinking it, it's sort of still okay, but damaging. I don't know if any of you were on the Dorchester Heritage Committee in 2001, uh, but I gave a talk then when I promised that within a year those excavations would be written up. Because that's what someone in Historic England told me on it ago. However, I have been told, well, first of all, there was the archaeologist did the work, David Bachelor, prepared prepared a report that was not published, but um, it, it was available. Uh, a chap called Pete Wilson did a, um, a redraft. That we have, we've got that report in our records, in the historic environment record. But what Nicola and one of her colleagues sent me is a, another report by a chap called John Magilton, written sometime in the early 2000s, um, where he reinterprets the stuff. They're a bit wary about me um, sending it to everyone, otherwise I'll just be with it out beforehand. But it might be acceptable at some point, I hope. But what they also say is they brought Pete Wilson back. Early last year, 2021, we commissioned Pete Wilson to publish the site. So it's possible, and I've said this once 20 years ago, but I'm saying it again, that there is a chance that this will be republished. And that report by John Magilton is quite interesting in that he does tell good stuff about the site. That the complex started um, maybe a bit earlier than we thought. We used to think the Roman town started about the years of 70. Well, this may have passed from the pottery dating, the building may have started a bit earlier than 60. Um, and then there's sort of, that looks very complex. In fact, that's because there was all sorts of series of rebuilds as, as it changed. And then in about the 4th century, so the 300s, 4th century AD, it goes out of use as a bathhouse, but people were still living there, as with, as with our Roman townhouse, I think. It's just in a, it's not quite as, what the Romans call, civilised way. So, I don't know, that's a bit more for you, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you sh I should have said that, I'm used to doing that. First of all, for a scale. The person at the top, they're walking like that. Does that help? Oh, yeah. So I'm good, yeah, you got him, that's it. There, does that give you, sorry, I should have said that, does that give you an idea of the scale? And you've got a six, I think it's, uh, do I know the exact detail? No, I don't. It took me long enough to work out where North was on this, I think it's behind. And it's taken, I think, from a photographic tower, or maybe like used to be done, someone in the bucket of a JCB that's gone up, which is highly illegal now, but I know it's been done. But they're looking down from behind Wollaston House, I think. I think. Um, and you have quite a complex area, but you've got the different types of building. So you have underfloor heating. So whereas in the Roman townhouse we have solid stone with channels into it, they have P line which are columns, tiles, the support floor. So those are heated rooms. That, I think, is a plunge pool. Okay? Beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> because having read this report I've got from John Magilton doesn't have any plans with it. So hopefully they've not been drawn up yet and it'll make more sense. The one, another thing that concerns me, he talks about, a little disparagingly, about the standards of recording. And I get the horrible feeling they might, it might be difficult to work out exactly how deeply buried this is. That's one thing you want to know for a start, you know, to make sense of it all. What you normally do now is not here with it, you draw the, the sections of your trenches, which gives you an idea of depth, and, you know, it's a scale of drawing. I'm not quite sure if that was done. But hopefully, 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 in a year or two's time, there will be a more detailed report that, you know, can give everyone an idea of what's involved.
And that, whenever people said to me over the years, why do people can't people um, re expose themselves to the toilet baths? One of the answers, first of all, is car parks, there's lots of issues there. But the other was we didn't understand it. Well, hopefully, when this is brought out, it could be understood better and, you know, informed decisions made like, is it a good idea or not? You know. Okay, right, sorry, enough about that. I've got lots of So I want to let you know that there is other stuff going on regularly in the area. Um, St George's Road, down the far end, excavation by AC Archaeology and a phased excavation ahead of the, that development there, sort of north of Black Gate, effectively. This is standing on the spot of the all these, oh, excavation on chalk for archaeologists is so easy. That's why so many archaeologists started their careers in this part of the world. Because all you do is take the soil off and it's black and white, and if it's white, it's soft. If it's not, keep digging. Field system, all sorts of things like that. It, it is that easy, aren't it? Um, I don't like doing it in that area, you probably can't quite see a little farmstead. And that, and the work on the other side, the bypass, is going to fit in really nicely with excavations as well that have undertaken on the adjacent part of the bypass when that was being constructed. So, you know, a nice bit of landscape work there. And the star coin, next one please. Then the coin of, not a coin, a silver coin of Cornwall. King of Mercia, 796 to 821. Just one of the points. Next one please. Keep blank. That's good. That's my first break. So what I'd like to try and do is show you some stuff about the wider area. And if there's any time, some of the, one of the things I was asked was to talk about the future of archaeology and so forth. And one of the things to me that's important is how you communicate it. So I'll try and do as much of that as possible. Shall I try and just watch through yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Right. There is a lot of stuff visible in this area that is so special. The museum is organising an event for um, cruise ship operators on Thursday to encourage people cruise ship operators, not to put people on coaches and things to Stonehenge, but come out here, look what we've got. Long Barrow, prehistoric burial mound, great man her cults. Little to see, but it's a prominent location on a hilltop, great place to go and look at. Communal burial, that's how they put the first farmers buried their dead together. They're all farmers, they're all living together in life and in death. Similar to Mormon Rings, a sacred space, as archaeologists call them, marking out a place special. The area between Dorchester and Weymouth and, and off to one side of it, generally called the South Dorset Ridgeway these days, has got three of the four surviving stone circles in Dorset, including this lovely one, the nine stones, uh, just west of Winterbourne Abbas. That's the most critical. Uh, you might see it very quickly. Uh, it used to be possible to park nearby, it isn't at the moment. But it's the thing I mentioned. Why is it there? Well, there's a river there. Maybe it's to do with a bit of Winterbourne, South Winterbourne. Maybe that's why it's there. Um, making that special. Barrows. About 2000 BC, well, a bit earlier, a few hundred years before that, the Bronze Age starts. People start thinking, well, chuck away this stone, we've got this new metal. Actually, it, it may be that a whole group of new people came into this country as recent genetic work was shown. And instead of burying their dead together, they get quite egotistical and they bury their dead on individually. Uh, and I would always say to people, and some of you have been on my walks, going on about barrows and working out where they are in the landscape and so forth, it's great fun. Everyone thinks they're on the hilltops, often they're not. They're on the sort of false crests overlooking little valleys and so forth. Um, so I think that tells you where the people who buried them are still living because they would then, could then look up their ancestor on a hill above them to protect them. And they, but then they became family plots and other people were buried in them. We know a lot about them because archaeologists damaged them. Colourford Tree Barrow, one of the most famous ones, uh, on the ridgeway between Dorchester and Weymouth. Why, why have we got a road in Dorchester called Colourford Tree? they called Colourford Road. I think it's because it went to Colourford Tree Barrow which was where the local hundred met in Saxon and more, more recent times. So, about barrows were reused for burial in Roman times, sort of Saxon times, but people still used them as a special place to meet. And most of these barrows on the hill got one added tree on it, got to lose there, but probably not there. And I think that's why they chose that one, because it was an easy place for people from several parishes to get together and meet. 
We've also got the rare survival, we didn't used to be, not before my product, modern agricultural glitches, um, where you get these ghost patterns of fields, often from the Bronze Age. This is the Valley of Stones, a hard monument. People were plowing on sloping land, as they did so the plants, the soil slip, built up against either hedges or stone walls that divided the fields up. When those fields go out of use, people take the stone away, cut the hedges down or whatever, but you still get those banks. So you get the ghost impression of the field systems from prehistory. Um, people didn't take much notice of them in the past because there were loads of them. It's like with wildlife, and you start losing them, you start caring. And now I think people recognise more the value of these midgets, which are from the very earliest times when, in the, about 1500 BC in the Bronze Age, when people started dividing the land into fields. Then in the Iron Age, they built hill forts, making cattle. Um, yeah. People wonder how to describe it. It's often described as the best Iron Age hill fort in Britain, uh, and it's only a mile away. And we live near it. <laughs> Other stuff in the area, Roman roads, they show really well. One of my favourite places is Thornton Wood Country Park, where because our countryside services also council clear it regularly. Um, people like me and the ranger there declare flat and we do them in the morning in January, can leave guided walks with people. And it's well worth seeing because you see it going straight up a hill, and when you get near the hilltop, you are walking on gravel that was probably put there in Rome. I've just got to show them more modern stuff, you know, just an example of Tide Barn at Abbott Street. Next one, please. Oh, and by the way, we've got fantastic water meadow systems around Dorchester as well. That's the picture I took hanging out on the airplane in flooding in February 1997. You wonder where it is. That's the bike path. That's the tip. Sewage Road. Um, Central Church is that way. But because it was flooding, those things that people normally don't take much notice of showed up really well because the water was in the channels. Archaeology. Got to show you this. Again, something I would rabbit on about because my heart was content was the wonderful archaeology dug on the way to the Leaf Road about 2008-2009. So that's the, the slice with a barrow under excavation there that was dug across the ridgeway. So our great find was the next one, please. The 50 beheaded Vikings. But why do we put things in museums so people can study them? There was a talk this summer as part of the Hillforce Painted project where someone re examined them and found that these Vikings, and we'll, I've been telling everyone have their heads cut off, that's how they died, wasn't it? She's got evidence that actually it may be that they had their throats cut first, because a few of them have got notches, cuts in the bone at the back. And when you've got someone's throat, in a few cases, the cut goes back to the bone. So if you've got a few of those with those cuts visible, it may be that they actually had their throats cut before. So we're finding out new information all the time from research. Oh, and by the way, really well preserved Iron Age village with walls and stuff at a place called Southdown Ridge near Upway Station. That'll never happen again, I thought. What a great shame. And then that was weird things. Hang on a minute, let's get let's get rid of them pylons, which no one wants. Uh spend half a billion on sticking the wires underground and after they say, Great, well I did they go ahead. So to archaeologists, Oxford archaeology excavating on that pipeline in early, uh, well, I said this, probably July 2020. The work started, in, the archaeological work started in 2019 uh, and finished about 2021, uh, and any month now, allegedly, some of those pilots are going to come down, so they have done yellow. But they needed a really big working easement because they had to put those wires underground and widely stretched. So what did the archaeologists find? What the stuff? Barrow under excavation, the barrow's been flattened, but often was digging the section through the survival of the ditch that was around it, that was the quarry that they piped up um, to make the barrow mound. On the top of the ridgeway itself, on the uh, south facing slope, we're looking down towards Weymouth with the cruise ships and the harbour in Portland, a really well preserved little Roman farming settlement. Uh, next one, please. For instance, with corn drying ovens and so forth, all surviving below ground. Next one, please. Elsewhere on the next ridge over, which is 
I want to go back. Um, a post Roman to about 600 AD, a uh, cemetery on a hilltop with burials, and then this one in a kiss setting, kiss being where you put, you dig a hole, you line it with stone. And one of my very favourite things you think, why that? They're digging a long barrow, one of these early prehistoric monuments, Neolithic monuments, because it didn't work. That's a hand shovel back. Yay, big. Okay. That. I loved it. I was there when that was being first found. I took my photo. That's a time. One of the pointy bits on a stag dancers. How do you dig in chalk when you haven't got um, metal tools? One of the things we always say is they use ankle feet. I think that's a, that's a bottom of the ditch. I think someone whacked that and broke it. Oh, that, that'll do. Left that behind and went away and stopped digging. But to me, that's a moment in prehistory. Maybe get a bit too many but something next. If you want to know more, I'll, I'll put this up later on if you like. But I would just say there are three webinars online that were all done last summer. Watch out the prehistoric one introduced by me. But if you just Google Dorset VIP scheme archaeology, you, you should still be able to get to them. There's three webinars by the archaeologist who run the project explaining three different factors periods of the excavation. But you want to say, how does archaeology continue and so forth? I don't, I'm not quite sure, but Archaeology is a massive industry. There's lots of things going on. We all think it should, everything should be dug up and so forth. And what we need to catch up on, I think, is telling people about it. And I hope this is a good example. Sorry. Dorset Council owns land and so forth up from development. North Key there, Weymouth Bold site. And I was involved in discussions, but I haven't done the majority of the work by a long way. We wanted to the council wanted to do what we normally do, some trial trenching to work out what's present on the site ahead of development. Got Pontex One Archaeological Services along, who are quite a small company, but they're very good at presenting their information and also communicating with people. So when they did a series of trenches in where we decided to put them around in that car park, uh, they also started talking to local people who were interested in archaeology, who initially were quite active in the council because of what was being done. Next one, please. This is the result. That group, including a chap called Mark Bright, um, who was one of the leaders of that group, uh, got a lot of respect for him. What does he want in life? He cares about the archaeology of his history of his town and he wants to know more. The context one was able to involve lots of local people, not only in the excavation, but doing things like Fending off other people who wanted to know what was going on and answering all the questions so they could get on with the work. And why did we do these trial trenches? Well, if you, when I saw this site, if someone said to me, what archaeology do you expect to survive from historic Weymouth? I would have said not much, because it's been flattened out and it's got tarmac on it. But actually, in the 1970s, when they did the research, it was pretty clear that all they'd done was just level it a bit and stick some tarmac on it. So there are really well preserved remains of buildings under there. Next one, please. And Cottage One is so good at doing this stuff, doing the research and working with local people to get the stuff, that when they were, almost as they were digging, they were interpreting it. This trench here, that one, they can say that one, that wall there, I think they're marking in red, that wall there, that one, that one, and so forth. Next one, please. And this is the Weymouth Bowl site. And this is my contribution, bringing a load of planning officers down. Because everyone sees, every side sees planners as the enemy. They're not. They're people who are doing, trying their best to do a good job and get them that everyone's happy with. You can agree, disagree with that later. But to me, all about explaining why we're doing archaeology. So I arranged a site visit for a load of my planning office colleagues to understand why people like me are banging on about archaeology all the time. And that's Richard McConnell, who runs the company uh, and his research at Tara. And what was so impressive was while we were looking at these two trenches, as they were digging them, they were saying that wall belongs to that, what belongs to that nation. That's the real wall of the Theatre Royal, and so forth. Just little walls in the site. And the way they present the evidence, the other trench, Cheryl, one of the other main places of the site, uh, by a medieval well, in quite a small trench. Next one, please. 
really well presented information. You can't read that, but that's just making you well. If they present it really well, but then they do 3D stuff, but it's way beyond me, technically. You cut away. So what is actually a solid face is almost like you've taken away that whole face of the trench. So you've got a section through that, they stuck a, trench, a camera down on a stick or a boat or something, and then sort of rectified it, which may make it all the same scale, I think. And we live in Dorset and it's great and we sort of get out and enjoy it more. Um, and that's also what's part of my job, I think, an important time doing that. So that's me doing one of the best things I could ever do in my life, which is leaving a guided walk on a hidden hill on a summer's evening. If you live in Dorset and you have not seen the sunset from Egerton Hill, you have missed out. You're not allowed to, to move out of the county or die until you've seen it, in my opinion. And, and then, you know, what most people do, look at the technology. I love this. More to be camped. This is in Dorchester, it's in the middle of the county, but I don't care, I'm going to show it you. This is just someone with a drone taking photographs of this little isolated hill fort, which even with a colour not being quite perfect, just shows you how good it can look. I like this so much, I'm going to show you another picture, see? In the other direction. And this was taken by uh, my contact chap called Brian Phillips from the Milton Abbas Historic Society, and he says, you can use these things in your presentations as long as you advertise it. <laughs> uh, I think that's my last one. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk, which will encourage us all to get out and, and look at some of these monuments. Um, we have got some time for some quick questions. Ah, Felicity, my way. Um, if and when we... Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. If, if and when the report on the most of the is um, forthcoming, how might you be more about it? The question was, if and when the, and if is a good, is a fair way of putting it, if and when the report on the Wollstone Bath, the Rome Bath, is available, when will we get to know about it? Um, I would hope it would be publicised by Historic England in a glare, a glare of publicity, make a big glare of it. Um, I'll make a semi-promise to you that if I still know any of you folks and I see a copy, I'll let you know when I see you in the street, if that's a fair response. Any further questions? Linda, for example? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it will provoke thoughts to be looking at some of these questions. No? Sure. Yeah. Just wondering when you talk about communication and involvement. Yeah. So I was wondering what, what can the civil society do to assist technology and unlawful interpretation? Um, I mean, yeah, lots, but it's also quite an issue, so I'll come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that Weymouth example is a bit of an exception, firstly, because it's the county council who's got the time, you know, and it's really needs to be, you know, help people and understand things. So it was possible to do that, and it worked really well. A lot of excavations are done commercially. So the idea is, people are saying quite rightly, we, you know, we're, we're operating commercially. We pay the archaeologists to do the recording you tell us to do, but we're not going to do any more. Someone like me will make a point of saying, yeah, but actually, if you're paying for good archaeology and you're doing it properly, boast about it. I can think of several examples where local people have been unhappy about development, I've actually had a chat with people with the archaeologists and so forth, and they've their attitudes have changed. Um, but also, there are safety reasons why the only people on the site who can work there can um, can work there because you've got machinery going down and all sorts of things like that. So it's not that easy anymore. Um, but you can do work. So most companies will or should involve people as volunteers to a degree. Whether you could expect and major development in Dorchester to be done by volunteers again, I don't know, because the cost of the post excavation the writing up and such. It's, it's done commercially, you know, and everyone thinks how the should be paid away, so it's done that way. How many other ways? There are so many ways. I mean, 
I used to do this with the Oxford Association. It was, it was often a good conduit to be able to contact, tell people when things were happening. So I don't know if the ladies remember, we used to be able to do site visits to the Oxford Association because often developers did want open days, but they would let a smaller group who were interested go along. So back in there, I'm trying to remember for them and so I said, then senior associates and you both. Um, but you can, I mean, you can also, in other ways, you can get involved, through, not just in the digging, but museums and so forth. And there are surveys that are, are being done. But, is it a failing? Possibly. Oculus is very successful. It's big business. You know, everything needs to be done, doesn't it? I'm not sure. I don't mind admitting that. Um, and should we do more to involve people and, you know, local people be involved? Yeah. Which is why when you say it didn't come to the talk, I enjoy doing it anyway, but it's also a duty. And I think you would also find, if you want speakers, um, AC Archaeology on that site at St George's Road when it's finished, uh, and John Boothroyd of um, Oxford Archaeology, he gave a talk at the Hillfox Henders thing. Um, but I would always say, if you go to our hospital companies who are doing work locally and say, give us a talk, uh, and a lot of some moan about it, but most, you know, appreciate they should be doing it. Sorry, it's, there's so many things to do. That's a start. Simple. Uh, we've got a question online from Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Hello, yes, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Let's go ahead. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for an excellent um, presentation and talk this evening. I was just thinking about your last comment there. It would be fantastic to get sort of schools involved as well in archaeology um, in the town and to really celebrate our, our, our archaeology um, and um, how we could move things forward with that, with liaising with the local schools and really getting them involved. I remember when I was a student at Hardy's and they had unfortunately just um, demolished Charles Street for the MEPC development, which obviously never happened. Um, but would they got us involved because I was studying classics um, and they got us involved in, um, in digging, basically, in doing some archaeology, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. In terms of the, the school kids digging, um, you probably wouldn't want a whole class doing that now for the safety reasons, but contracting companies do take on often six formers or something you're interested in our career. Um, and actually, that's another problem in archaeology in recent years. Companies often just took on people who were qualified and had experience. How do you get that experience? You couldn't. There's now shortage of staff and they're taking on people more. Um, doing stuff until absolutely right. Um, just to show off, last week I took a class from um, St. Nicholas and uh, St. Mara School in Weymouth around two of Roman Dorchester. And the week before that, I gave a talk in a class at Prince of Wales School. But that's me showing off because a few weeks before that I hadn't done any. But I like to turn that sort of thing. And you do get projects that involve that. I've seen a couple of ones in the council, including one linked to the South Dorset Bridgeway. Um, it becomes more difficult. What you find is that, whether it's archaeology or something else, uh, an organisation brings someone on as part of a bigger project to liaise with schools. And that person goes round to all the local schools. And a lot of them say, great idea, lovely, but we're so tight with the national curriculum, what we've got to do, we can't get involved. Uh, and I won't name names, but, you know, I know two people who, one who gave up, you know, and one who, well, one who gave up, because they just, this frustration, there was some they could work with. Um, those two schools I mentioned, though, were ones that I got linked with because organisers of the, the old South Cross Ridgeway project wanted to have an, had an access to experts programme, or access to experts and seed programme, more accurately, where we would, People like me would go and talk to teachers and so forth. So, I, yeah, I think oh, that's a great idea. It's just sometimes a problem for schools because we've got so much else to do. Right, the question was about the, the Vikings, are they, where are they? They're down the road in the Cat Museum store, but some of them are on display. There's a, a display cabinet with some stuff in there. Um, but that's where they are. Were they covered over? No, because the road is going to go, go through them. Um, 
should that have happened, you know, there's the thing about reburial and respect and so forth. So Oculus now shouldn't dig things up for the sake of it, it's only because it can be decided by development. And that's a, that in itself is quite an interesting argument in that case, because I think if you say, well, you should bury them with the same respect as they were buried um, originally, well, then we should go and find an old quarry hole and chuck them in. Just get them in. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry it's disrespectful, but that, yeah. you know, that's the way it was. Oh, what were you about? Were you asking about the cut or something? Or was that? Yeah. Um, at the lecture of the year, the 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 on the way of the um, she was talking about how um, she said to the to allow the to to allow the to 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 I'm sure you know that the Lord Fuller is only part of the song. I don't know where the other half of the song But I just wonder what your thoughts are on that continued power of the song. Well, the song is very much about the song. Question as usual. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is the case. Um, that the board remains are destroyed by ploughing and not just here across the whole county. Uh, and I also know I've been talking to some of the people who, who are making efforts on the part anymore, you know, to try and stop that happening. Um, but yes, you know, it, it, is, it is the case that ploughing destroys our theology. Um, as far as I've that, um, that continues. I mean, What's that thing to say? I mean, the other side to that is that why why have people like me got, got jobs as archaeologists? Maybe because the society we've got so good at food production, and that's always the I mean, the irony of it. We've got so good at food production that we've got a surplus to afford to pay these flipping archaeologists a job. <laughs> so look after what's left after the. So yeah, I, I don't know. I can't think of what to say from that, but there is a point. There is very important archaeology there, and not just there. That it's been ploughed, and I mean, you know, the legal protection. You think something's a scheduled monument, therefore it must be protected. But of course, anything that happened in the five years beforehand, before the scheduling can continue. So we used to get complaints every year from people who that barrow is being ploughed up on the ridgeway, and that was because I, as an archaeologist, put, or you couldn't go along with the trowel and put that in the ground without legal protection. But a farmer was perfectly entitled to plan that. Um, so the, the legislation has tightened. You know, it used to, the scheduling used to, just used to be so that archaeologists have a bit of a dig round before they develop it. Whereas now it's a lot tighter. Um, and things like countryside stewardship or so government and other attempts to strengthen that sort of thing. Um, but it will. It still happens, it probably always will be. And another thing about archaeology, we don't know what's important. So something we we think that's a blank field, they can buy what they want, you know, that's when you've got 50 head of Vikings or something like that. I think we're going to have to call it today. And really, thank you, Steve, for such an interesting talk and interesting answers to the question. Uh, and I think it encourages us at least to have another archaeological talk next next season and perhaps do this as a permanent feature keep you all aware of what's going on so if we could just show how much we appreciate you in the traditional way